So we had we just had to stop for some cows. Honk for the baby. I know. They like that spot, huh? Get poop on the tires. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Beat. I mean, Mr. Beat. One of the first things that got me into history when I was in elementary school was learning about the Oregon Trail. Sure, a big reason why I got into it was the classic computer game, which I played on DOS, by the way, which stands for Disk Operating System. DOS was the main type of operating systems that personal computers used in 1990, and yeah, it looked like that. Just a bunch of text commands. And yes, this was before we had the internet. I mean, we used floppy disks like this for crying out loud. Look, I'm really old, okay? Anyway, we had one computer in my second grade classroom, and we all raced to get our work done so that we could get a chance to play the Oregon Trail. It was addictive and educational. Sure, it wasn't fun when we died of dysentery, but it also taught us about how incredibly difficult the journey was on the Oregon Trail, especially during the 1840s. Odds are, if you know anything about the Oregon Trail, it's because you have played or are at least familiar with that game. I would assume most people, their their cultural touchstone with the Oregon Trail is the video game. You know, you've died of dysentery is a very popular catchphrase. To this day, you're wearing the hat, I have the t-shirt. Even my kids who are now high school and college, when they were little, they would play it and my son would always load his wagon train with all of his sisters and would laugh hysterically when they drowned or got bit by a snake or got dysentery. For him and his generation, and really for anybody younger than me, the Oregon Trail video game has continued to make the Oregon Trail relevant. For sure, like I played that a ton as a kid. I always seemed to die of like dysentery or cholera or didn't ford the river correctly. See? However, in case you have never heard of the classic computer game, the Oregon Trail was a 2,170 mile route that started at the western border of Missouri and ended in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Most began the journey in Independence, Missouri and ended it in Oregon City, which is today basically a suburb of Portland. Before the emergence of the railroad, it was one of only two main overland trails to the American American West, the other being the Santa Fe Trail, which also started in Independence, but ended in modern day Santa Fe, New Mexico. It wasn't a road like the roads you see today. Think of it as a rope. A rope is actually made up of many smaller fibers, and that's how the Oregon Trail was. Sometimes these fibers all lined up perfectly. Often, they did not. And it wasn't created at once. Fur traders and trappers, often called, quote, mountain men, more or less built the entire trail. Although most people don't know that they were often relying on a much older network of Native American footpaths and animal trails that headed West. But yeah, the mountain men were out there wandering around in the wilderness anyway, so they figured they'd better establish something more permanent. By the 1830s, these fur traders and trappers had been regularly traveling on it, by horseback or just walking on it. In March 1836, Narcissa and Marcus Whitman led the first notable migrant wagon train west on what would later be called the Oregon Trail. They were missionaries, hoping to convert native Native Americans to Christianity. Fur traders joined them, traveling in covered wagons, each pulled by six mules. They ended up traveling all the way to near present day Walla Walla, Washington. By 1840, the trail went as far west as the Willamette Valley in Oregon country, which at the time was claimed by both the United States and the United Kingdom, specifically the Hudson's Bay Company, which made a lot of 
money there. Also by 1840, fur traders had decimated the beaver population, and the fur trade suffered because of it. In the 1840s, now entire families began to regularly migrate out west on the trail instead of mountain men. In September 1840, Robert Newell and Joseph Meek and their families led the first wagons to reach the Columbia River over land. That same year, Joel Walker had also successfully brought his wife and five kids to Oregon via the trail. In 1841, the Bartleson Bidwell Party was the first immigrant group that made the entire journey by wagon from Missouri to the Willamette Valley. Well, half of them did. The other half split off to go to California and barely survived the rest of the trip. In May 1842, Elijah White led the first big wagon train on the Oregon Trail. It included 114 people in 19 wagons. They made pretty good time. Pretty good time. Getting to Oregon country in August. For most immigrants on the Oregon Trail later on, it would take at least four to five months. These successful journeys on the trail proved to others back east that it was possible to survive the journey to settle in the fertile Willamette Valley, an area where apparently if you just made it there, you could seemingly have as much land as you wanted. In 1843, between 700 and 1,000 people made the trip. Over the next 25 years, between 350,000 and 500,000 headed west on the Oregon Trail. And though I've never seen them in person, apparently you can still see these ruts today. They are preserved in stone and rock. Seriously. Hmm. Hey, did you know the, the wagon wheel ruts from the Oregon Trail immigrants are still visible? Ha! Wouldn't it be cool to see them? It says here you can drive the entire Oregon Trail today. It's called the Oregon Trail Auto Tour Route. And it actually goes near our house. This is a good book. I've been reading it. Uh, it lays out a perfect road trip, checking out all the historical markers along the ways, places to, to stay, places to eat. Although it kind of, you know, takes away the adventure of it, you know? I mean, the pioneers who were on the Oregon Trail in the 1840s, it was really difficult for them. For us, it would be way too easy. But you know what would make it an adventure? If we did the entire road trip in an EV, you know? Because there's not very many charging stations along the way, probably. Yeah. So I found a website that lets you rent Teslas. Let's rent a Tesla and drive the Oregon Trail with it, huh? What an adventure it will be. So I've read the entire book and I learned a lot. However, the author of the book, Katrina Emery, didn't have any specific advice about driving in an EV. So, you know what? I'm just gonna call her. First of all, Katrina, I have um, per I purchased your book. I want to say that this was partially what inspired me to make this trip. So, kudos Thank for that. You. I'm a little worried about charging stations. Do you think I'll be fine? I won't get stranded. <laughs> yeah, you might want to do some extra research in Wyoming specifically. Yeah. Um, there's some empty swaths of land out there, so I didn't do it in a Tesla. Even gas stations in Wyoming are few and far between, so that would be my only caution. The rest of the trail, you should be okay, but... <laughs> uh, part of the Oregon Trail does follow the interstate, like some interstate. Yeah. 
but yeah, basically the interstate the trail was so well worn that it became a road which became an interstate so um a lot of it is actually the major road now just because that's how people got places heck yeah that's yeah. going to be convenient what are i would say like your top historical spots that you have to visit along the way the best one i think is the guernsey ruts in wyoming it's this soft stone and there were so many wagons that passed by that there's an actual like canyon in the stone because the wagon wheels cut down and it's about four feet deep so you can actually stand in them picture these wagons going by and the further down they cut they had to keep going on that exact trail so it just cuts deeper and deeper um, so you're actually standing in the wagon ruts in the middle of wyoming there's so many wagons that just kept going on that one path and it was kind of soft it's like sandstone so it carved up pretty easily I actually really enjoyed Scott's Bluff in western Nebraska it's not what you think of when you think of Nebraska so it's kind of fun to be like oh this is Nebraska too you can go on some hikes there uh, you can see kind of the whole Platte River Valley it's also right next to Chimney Rock which is fun to see you can't hike up to Chimney Rock, you kind of just have to view it at a distance. But especially if anyone grew up playing the Oregon Trail computer game, that's a fun <laughs> sight to see. You can hit all the same spots, kind of check them off your computer game list. Right by Guernsey Ruts in Wyoming, there's Register Cliff, which is this big cliff of that same soft sandstone and people wrote their names in it. So it's pretty cool to see like, man, people were right here. It's kind of hard to follow the real trail because so many people like, oh, well that's backed up. I'm going to go over here. So the trail changed even as history went on. But if you're going to do the whole thing, it's a trip that lets you see so much of the country, but from kind of a perspective that isn't as advertised. We're doing it in seven days. Is that? Is it's fast. It oh, okay. How long did you do it in? We took uh, three weeks. It's a lot to cover. I mean, you know, it's just going to be a lot of driving. If you're open to it, it would be yeah. kind of cool just to briefly meet up with you in Oregon City. Definitely. Unless we like get stranded somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck. I hope you don't. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll be fine. It'll be a fun trip. You'll see so much. I'm excited for you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Now, I realize many of you probably aren't fans of the CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, and I get why, but I am a big fan of Tesla cars, and mad props to all the engineers who have designed them and everyone involved building them. They are amazing vehicles, and one day I hope to purchase one. Maybe. All right. So I was able to find a pretty good deal on Turo. I found a Tesla Y available with unlimited mileage. I'm a little nervous because a Tesla Y is a pretty expensive car. I've driven expensive cars before, but never more than 20 miles an hour. So I am a bit nervous renting this, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Yeah, let's do this. I convinced Mrs. B to come along. In fact, I'm bringing my entire family and forcing them to help me film. Don't worry, I'll pay them. We will be traveling more than 2,000 miles in seven days. I've planned out an itinerary that has us stopping at many historical landmarks and many uh, charging stations. Now, we won't be able to stop at all of the historical landmarks, of course, but I'm going to at least hit the most significant ones and we're not just driving the interstate okay we will often be going off the beaten path not just to two-lane highways but even some dirt roads oh and and we're going in august remember it won't take us four to five months to get there just seven days hopefully just so you know in the computer game and in real life it was best to leave in early spring to get through the mountains before it got too cold and snowy in late autumn our pace will be grueling. This will be the second most epic road trip I have ever been on. Uh, yeah, my brother and I once drove to Alaska and back in 18 days, so... After picking up the car, we begin at the beginning of the trail, which today is marked by the National Frontier Trails Museum in Independence, Missouri. Lucky us, we get the entire museum to ourselves, and I get to interview Travis Boley with the Oregon California Trails Association. I kind of view the Oregon Trail and the California Trail as long linear national parks. They're a way to explore 
uh, American history in a 2,000 mile linear fashion following the exact same paths, sometimes right on top of it. Especially in modern day cities, a lot of people don't even realize you're driving on a street. That might have been the trail. Here in the Kansas City area, Blue Ridge Boulevard, which runs Independence south through Raytown and into Kansas City, was the trail. When you're driving along it, it's very easy to see because you're just kind of winding around following the topography. Whereas most of the streets in this city are north, south, east, west. It just sort of meanders lazily towards the southwest, just as the wagon trains would have done. What's something that you like to share about the Oregon Trail that not a lot of people know about? The 1842 Elijah White Party. By the time they got to what's now Olathe, Kansas, uh, a vote was held. They decided to kill all the dogs. They were worried about drawing in wolves or dogs barking might lead to Indian attacks. So Elijah White orders all the dogs killed. The dogs are being killed. A lot of diarists wrote extensively and graphically about what happened. That really brings the reality of the trail home for people. You've done this trip yourself. How many times? Oh man, I've lost <laughs> count. Um, wow. Sometimes not in its entirety, but pretty much annually, at least. We're doing it in a Tesla. And oh. so do you think we should be worried about charging stations? Right now, some places might get a little touch and go in terms of charging stations if you're staying right on the trail. And I'm thinking mostly of central Wyoming. I'll make sure when you're in Casper to get a real good full charge. Yeah. I do not know where the next charging station west of there is. I don't know if Lander or I think Lander actually, I did find one. Okay, the, yeah. the, you'll probably make it then. <laughs> you'll probably make it then. Well, if you break down, you'll have a very authentic trail experience. That's the, exactly, yeah. that's why we're doing it. Obviously, we'll be checking in with the video game from time to time. Hmm. Before leaving Independence, you should buy equipment and supplies. You have $1,600 in cash, but you don't have to spend it all now. Now, this is interesting because this isn't much less than we actually budgeted for this trip. Okay, it's time to load up the wagon. We're gonna get some flour here. How about some rice? Oh, beans, I'll be farting, but it, it'll be good for me. Salt to help preserve the food. And last but not least, cornmeal. But you also gotta make sure you got some clothing, backup clothing, you never know if you get wet. A little blanket for when you get up in the mountains. And then of course you've gotta get some dried fruit, vinegar, a caps, castor oil. Okay, some tin cups, got some plates. Uh, oh, so we gotta be able to ground up the coffee. 100 pounds of meat. If we get too heavy here though, we might be overloading. Can't buy too much. I'm also got some, how could I forget water at this point? Get some water. This was the exact spot that many pioneers started from on their journey west on the Oregon Trail and California Trail and Santa Fe Trail. They stopped by a general store in town and then went on their way. So these are some typical prices of items that you would need on the Oregon Trail. In the video game, you can buy some as well, but this is a more comprehensive list. Now, other starting points included Council Bluffs as well as St. Joseph. So that this wasn't the only place where they started it from. Okay, I've got my book and I'm ready to go. And so we head west. According to the video game's map, Fort Kearney is the first major landmark, but we won't be there until day three. No worries, there are other cool spots to check out until then. First, we make our way through the great metropolis of Kansas City. I head to a major intersection, but there were no stoplights at this intersection. Behind me, you can see a swale, one of many around here, and you can even, if you look closely enough, you can see ruts left behind from the wagons that were traveling through here on the Oregon Trail. Here, wagon trails crossed the Blue River by fording until some folks finally built a bridge here in 1859 anyway. Several immigrants wrote about this crossing in their diaries. It was the first major obstacle. Today, all of this is in a lovely city park called Minor Park. By the way, for the majority of the length of the Oregon Trail, the California Trail overlaps it. Today, Minor Park is within Kansas City. Back in the 1840s, this area was already quite a ways away. Already in the middle of nowhere. Okay, so we're in Olathe, Kansas now, and 
I don't need a charge yet, but I'm doing it just to be safe. So it's the first time I've ever done this before. It was surprisingly pretty easy. Next, I head southwest of Kansas City to Gardner Junction, where the Oregon and California Trail break away from the Santa Fe Trail. But this would have been another high traffic area. Lots of people going to and fro. A major intersection without stoplights. We still have lots of cars and trains. In the heyday of these routes, the ones who headed down the Santa Fe Trail tended to be traders. The ones who stayed on the Oregon slash California Trail were mostly immigrants headed to permanently relocate to either Oregon or California. That's why they had wagons. They brought with them everything they owned. Fortunately for me, I'm not doing that. Next, I head northwest down some dirt roads and then county highways to get to the first notable Oregon Trail landmark that most don't know about. Much of the Oregon Trail was actually quite boring, and so landmarks really stood out, like this one called Blue Mound. It was the first big landmark that stood out. It was called Blue Mound because back then in the 1840s, there weren't a whole lot of trees in what is today Kansas. It was just prairie, grassland. The trees were just around creeks and streams, you know, bodies of water. But this giant hill rose above the prairie with trees on it, and thus it got the nickname Blue Mound. Today, there are trees everywhere because humans planted them later on. That served as a big landmark that's about 56 miles west from where the trail begins. And it was a signal that the travelers were about to get to the Wakarusa River, which today is just outside of the city of Lawrence. Well, we're approaching the end of the first day of this trip. And fortunately, we live really close to the actual Oregon Trail. So we're just gonna crash at our place tonight. Okay, so we're going to charge it at home and I, there's an adapter. We're just plugging it into a regular wall outlet and it charges very slowly when you do that. Um, at the current rate, it says it will be fully charged in 15 hours. All right, so it's day two, and we are now as an entire family packed into the Tesla, and we are headed toward Topeka on what used to be the Oregon Trail, which is today Highway 40. Just to be safe, we're going to go ahead and charge right off the bat. So we're gonna charge in Topeka. Topeka. We're just paranoid, so we're kinda, of, what's that called? Range anxiety. That's uh, <laughs> That's been, <laughs> especially with her. Oh, fun story. We were packing up last night for the, the trip and our youngest daughter wanted to pack 10 pounds of squishies. And we told her that on the Oregon Trail, you gotta pack light. And so we made her only bring like, how many squishies? Like five. Like five squishies. No, I, I oh, you snuck some more in there. Yes. Well, hopefully the wagon doesn't tip over. It was pretty cool to see that a modern road that went close to where I live actually followed the actual trail. We're charging again at a supercharger. For some reason, this one's by an Arby's. I guess I can do something else while I wait. Further west, we go on another stretch that also follow the actual trail, but first we had to cross the mighty Kansas River. This is the first part where you stop in the computer game, by the way. Yeah, that's pretty much how it looks. We didn't have to ford the river, which means drive right through it. We also didn't have to float the car across or take a ferry. We just drove over a bridge, easy peasy. Nice gravel road now, but 
what the actual Oregon Trail would have looked like was mud. Now I'm at a lovely little park called the Oregon Trail Nature Park. There's all kinds of hiking trails. Nobody's here. So far, there have not been many people other than us. We're the only crazy people to do this, I guess, especially in a Tesla. But regardless, it's really cool around this area because the park is actually on Oregon Trail Road, a road which follows the exact path of the trail more or less for several miles. We'll actually be on the Oregon Trail, not just like a road near it. Know what I mean? Then we start to go into the middle of nowhere, losing cell phone reception. We cross the Vermilion River, which today is near the town of Louisville, Kansas. The explorers Kit Carson and John Fremont crossed here in 1842, and so did the Donner Party in 1846. You know the Donner Party, right? The group that headed west on this trail to California, and due to a series of missteps, got stuck in the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and the only ones who made it survived due to cannibalism? Anyway, a dude made a small fortune here. Behind me is the Vermilion River, and in order to cross it, you needed someone to help you. And the person to help you across this river was a man by the name of Louis View. He was of both Native American and French ancestry, and he was very familiar with this area. And because of his success getting travelers across this river, he was able to charge quite a bit of money. He charged $1 per outfit to guide you across this river. And on a good day, he made up to $300. And that was back in the 1840s and 1850s. So whatever that is today, that's a lot of freaking money. Today, there's a small park where there used to be a massive elm tree during the 1840s. Immigrants called it the Lewis View Elm. Actually, in 1848, the tree would have been 132 years old. When the tree died in 1998, it was 282 years old. Today, a gazebo was built around where the tree once stood. So, I didn't anticipate this many dirt roads, but fortunately, we're still at 81%. But we've been on a lot of dirt roads today, and we have not encountered many other humans. <laughs> so. It already kind of has felt like a bit of an adventure. Next up, we hit a popular camping spot near the modern town of Westmoreland, which is where we also happen to eat lunch. I'm at Scott Springs, named after a spring nearby. A dude named Scott found it, I think. This is a very popular camping spot. You know why? Because there was a natural spring here. Since the actual springs are on private property, we just hang out at the park located just south of the site. It is a pretty nice park with this epic sculpture. A natural spring, fresh water after a long hot day of traveling. That's right, Scott Springs. And then next we're gonna go to Alcove Spring, which is just in time. Cause I am really hot. I am sweating and I could use some clean water fresh, rejuvenating, although it's uh, just a trickle at the moment, but oftentimes when travelers were heading west along the trail here, they'd come by and they'd see a roaring waterfall. Alcove Spring was a popular stop for immigrants on the trail. A member of the Donner Party actually carved into the limestone cliff where the waterfall is, Alcove Springs, and you can still barely see it, although we can't seem to find it. It is indeed hot when we arrive, but keep in mind, most who got here on the trail got here in early spring. This is actually the gravesite of Sarah Keyes, who was a member of the famous Donner Party. She died at this spot on May 29th, 
1846. Remember, it's not like there were any ways to get bodies back home easily or any nearby cemeteries. If you died along the trail, you got buried along the trail. And the depressing thing is, we may never know where the vast majority of people buried along the trail actually are. They are likely forever lost. Unfortunately, this area was also a place where a lot of people died. There were no hospitals around here. All right, so we have to go this way on our journey. Oregon City, Oregon is the final destination. It's just 1,853 miles. Where we started yesterday, Independence, Missouri, about 179 miles that way. So we still have a ways to go. Near Alcove Spring, there's Independence Crossing, which also so happens to be the next stop in the computer game. It calls it the Big Blue River Crossing, and yeah, that's not what it looks like at all. We cross the river over a bridge. It's no problem at all. In the game, you once again have to ford, float, or ferry across. Next up, we head to US Route 77 to Marysville, Kansas, thinking we can charge there, but it would take too long, so onward we go. We then drive literally on the border between Kansas and Nebraska in Lanham, Nebraska, to look for an Oregon Trail marker there, but can't find it and can't look it up because we lose internet access. And then Mrs. Beat's range anxiety really starts to kick in. We have 43% left, which is fairly good. This will get us to our destination for tonight, which is Grand Island, Nebraska. Uh, however, we'll be cutting it close. So uh, I guess we drove too much in the middle of nowhere today, and we won't be getting to Grand Island until like after six. So there's that. The good life, but let's live the, live the good life here. So we're in Beatrice, Nebraska. We found a charging station, but it's not a Tesla supercharger station, so it's not really fast. It's really, really slow. If we wanted to get to 100%, it would take over nine hours. So we're just gonna hang out here for a while and get some, get enough charge to get to Grand Island, basically. So charging in Beatrice was a bust, so we go way off the trail to the nearest supercharger, which is north in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oof. So we made to Lincoln, Nebraska. We'll get back on the trail here soon, don't you worry. Well, that sucked. After we get done charging, we hop on Interstate 80 to a hotel we had reserved in Grand Island. I had originally hoped to get all the way to Kearney by this point, so we are already behind schedule. We are here live in Grand Island, Nebraska, once again charging the Tesla. And then we're gonna go to a grave site. We're gonna see some dead people. But first we drive through an area that immigrants used to call the quote, coast of Nebraska. An area covered by sand hills, covered in grass near the broad Platte River. We follow this extraordinary river the rest of the day. Oh, and also by this time, the Mormon Trail has met up with the Oregon slash California trails. And collectively the three trails are known as the quote, immigrant trail. Immigrants appreciated the Platte River as it provided lots of water and awesome grasses for game and livestock. Oh, and buffalo poop to help build fires. In fact, immigrants often said the stretch near the Platte was the easiest part of the whole journey. However, that river also had a dark side. Often in its water were bacteria and viruses that caused disease and death. And yep, our next visit is to our second grave site. I'm at the grave site of Susan C. Hale. She died of cholera at this spot, was buried here. Hundreds of Oregon Trail immigrants died of cholera. Susan's husband actually apparently turned around and went back to Missouri after her death, but then later came back to install a proper gravestone. However, that gravestone is long gone, and the Hastings Nebraska Outdoor Club put this one here in 1933. Susan Hale is one of the few names we actually know regarding all the people that died from cholera along the trail. They got it by drinking the water. She was drinking water in the nearby Platte River 
and it had bacteria in it. So far on this trip, we haven't got any diseases. Um, we, we have been drinking bottled water, which is probably bad too, actually. We also have modern medicine in, uh, in case something happens. There's hospitals along the trail today, so. We're good. In the computer game, Fort Kearney is the next big stop, and no, it looks nothing like that. Then again, what we see today is mostly a reconstruction, as all the original sod and adobe buildings are long gone. Okay, now we are at Fort Kearney Historical Park near Kearney, Nebraska. This, of course, is the site of Fort Kearney, which was built in 1846 to protect travelers going on the Oregon Trail slash California Trail. Later, it also served as an outpost for the Pony Express. Fort Kearney was the first fort built on the Oregon Trail slash California Trail. The first one! And there really wasn't much out here when they built it. There weren't many trees, and that's why most of the structures were built out of sod, because it was easier to get sod to build stuff with than trees. The fort was discontinued in 1871, but they have now preserved uh, the forts, and you can check it out. So let's check it out. Check it out! The fort was named after future General Stephen Watts Kearney. It was definitely a place where immigrants felt safe from Native American attacks, which were increasingly a threat in this remote area. Here, the journey is 16% done. Oh, by the way, while at the visitor center, we meet someone who has actually watched some of my videos, which freaks me out a bit. Then we're soon back on the interstate, which was a bummer, but we have to find another charger, which happens to be in a a bustling parts of North Platte, Nebraska. Guess what? They have squeegees here. I didn't even know. I didn't have to steal from the gas station. This city is where the North Platte River and South Platte River both empty into the Platte. Immigrants had to make the difficult crossing here of the South Platte, which is not in the computer game, by the way. From this point forward, the Oregon slash California slash Mormon Trail followed the North Platte north into what is now Wyoming. Even though we had just charged, we decided to charge again in Ogallala. It is getting very windy. We didn't need that much of a charge, but we're just getting it to 100% so we can make it all the way to Scott's Bluff. We haven't actually seen any Oregon Trail historic landmarks for a while, uh, so it's been kind of boring the last three hours, but the fun begins very soon. That's where we head off the interstate onto US Route 30, where the landscape starts to change. Okay, I just checked. There are no rattlesnakes up here, so we're good to go, but we are now at California Hill behind me. This was a particularly hard hill for travelers to go up and, uh, and over. It was the first time that travelers on the Oregon Trail slash California Trail encountered pretty abrupt elevation. When they were going along the Platte River, it was fairly flat. But from here on out, it's gonna get a bit hillier. Watch out. From here, as we enter the Nebraska Panhandle, the scenery gets more dramatic. While the views are breathtaking, my family is getting tired, and we are quickly running out of daylight, with three more stops yet to go. Next, we arrive at Ash Hollow State Historical Park, which doesn't look like stereotypical Nebraska at all. All right, we have been climbing up Windlass Hill. It's in western Nebraska, and we are out of breath, and we haven't even got to the top of it. Behind me, if you look closely enough you can see the actual ruts left behind by wagons traveling west on the Oregon Trail. It's uh, pretty stark actually, pretty easy to see. Now the land has been turned over to cows. 
During the heyday of the trails, no one called it, quote, Windless, Windless Hill, Hill, but many immigrants did write about it in their diaries, particularly noting the abundance of trees and fresh water here. All right, we made it to the top of Windlass Hill. It's literally a 360 degree view of wagon ruts. So this is probably the best place today you can find so many ruts left behind all in one place. Check it out. Next up, we go to two rock formations near Bridgeport that both rise 400 feet above the North Platte Valley. Okay, we've made it to Courthouse and Jail Rocks, two of the most famous landmarks along the Oregon slash California Trail. But it was so impressive because for miles, you know, you basically just had a somewhat boring landscape treeless not much going on and then all of a sudden these bust out it was so impressive that some travelers would travel five miles off of the trail to get a closer look at them and climb them but we're not going to climb them today we're just looking at them from here but they look nice Courthouse Rock is the bigger one, but Jail Rock is pretty impressive too, you gotta admit. In November 1841, a passerby named Rufus Sage wrote, quote, Occupying a perfectly level site in an open prairie, it stands as the proud palace of solitude, amid here boundless domains. Its position commands a view of the country for 40 miles around and meets the eye of the traveler for several successive days in journeying up the Platte. Often these two landmarks are overshadowed by arguably the most famous landmark on the entire Oregon Trail, which is just about 12 miles to the northwest. Okay, we've made it to the most iconic landmark on the Oregon Trail, period. A big reason why is because it's featured in the video game, but it is Chimney Rock. After all these years, even though back in the 1840s, folks said, oh, it's gonna tip over any day now. If you happen to come here, I am placing a Mr. Beat Rock for you to find, um, or some random person to find that doesn't watch my stuff. But I'm gonna put it in this wagon here, right behind here, okay? It's gonna be right back here. If you find it, let me know. Use the hashtag Mr. Beat Rocks. So yeah, check out Chimney Rock. If you're at the museum at this exact spot, you can get a Mr. Beat Rock on your own journey on the Oregon Trail. This iconic rock formation, which rises around 300 feet, can easily be seen from US Route 26. And today is a designated national historic site featuring a visitor center, which is closed by the time we arrive. It's likely early fur traders were the ones who came up with the name chimney rock because it looks like you know the uh, chimney hey get your head out of the gutter oh the Lakota Sioux used to call it elk penis because it looked like um well anyway let's call it chimney rock shall we and yes this is the next landmark in the computer game You know what? It does look like that. Perhaps it's a little shorter these days. Yes, Chimney Rock used to be taller in the 1840s, but has lost some of its height by erosion and lightning and, oh yeah, apparently people have historically fired cannons at it. I'm not joking. Anyway, it's a big landmark, if not the biggest, on the whole trail. And our last stop of the day, we find a hotel to stay at in nearby Scott's Bluff since it has a charging station last night uh, it was good uh, we stayed the night at this hotel and as you can see behind me there's a charger a very slow one it took about nine hours but while we slept the car charged so it all worked out we're at 100 percent between scotts bluff nebraska and casper wyoming on the oregon trail auto tour there is a lot of cool stuff to check out first we check out the legacy of the plains museum and we're pretty much the only ones there which by this time i'm noticing is a theme on this entire trip
It was there I learned about Ezra Meeker, a dude who first traveled the Oregon Trail by ox-drawn wagon when he was a youngin' back in 1852 with his wife, infant son, brother, and sister-in-law. Although their six-month journey was incredibly difficult, they all survived, including the baby. Later in life, as a much older and much wealthier man, Meeker decided to take the journey again. He had become worried that people were forgetting about Dre. Er, I mean the Oregon Trail. And he wanted to raise more awareness of its history, so he basically did it as a publicity stunt. From 1906 to 1908, while he was in his late 70s, he retraced his steps along the Oregon Trail by wagon, hoping to build monuments along the way. For the rest of his life, he became famous, making the trip several more times, one time even being pulled by oxen. He even got to meet Theodore Roosevelt and Calvin Coolidge. Today, we can certainly thank Meeker for helping to preserve the legacy of the trail. Anyway, just down the road, or, uh, trail of the legacy of the Plains Museum is the rock the nearby city we stayed in is named after. Scott's Bluff, baby. <laughs> In 1845, General Philip St. George Cook said of this rock, quote, This morning marched three miles, still nearer to that mysterious mountain, without being disenchanted of its colossal ruins and phantom occupants. It was another prominent Oregon slash California slash Mormon trail landmark, one that immigrants literally couldn't get through. Once travelers got to Scott's Bluff, they had a difficult choice to make because they had to figure out which way were they gonna detour around the badlands of this area. Now, now that was before 1851. Beginning in 1851, Mitchell Pass opened up for easy access that went right by Scott's Bluff. You can see behind me actually, this follows the updated Oregon Trail as of 1851. Today it's a paved highway, but that made it a lot quicker to get through this area, so. <laughs> We cross into Wyoming, a state which will be in the next couple days at least. By the time we get to arguably the most famous fort on the entire trail, it is freaking hot outside. But at least it's a dry heat now. It's a dry heat. Probably the most welcome sight for sore eyes other than seeing Oregon for travelers headed west on the Oregon Trail was Fort Laramie, which is behind me. Fort Laramie was established first as a trading post and a very important one to load up on supplies. Many people don't know this, but Fort Laramie continued to serve as a military outpost for much of the rest of the 1800s, even long after people traveled on the Oregon Trail. Fort Laramie is the next stop in the computer game. Meh, it doesn't look much like that. At least not today. This was a pretty popular and hopping place. It was named after Jacques Le Ramy, a French-Canadian trapper who was one of the first Europeans in the area. Many of the original structures of Fort Laramie are still here. Not only that, there are reenactors. Cool beans. Located where the Laramie River meets the North Platte River, Fort Laramie is just as famous for other stuff as as it is a place of refuge for folks traveling west on the immigrant trail in the 1840s. The original fort goes back to the 1830s and was called Fort William after the fur trapper William Sublet. <laughs> It would have normally been a day's journey from Fort Laramie to our next location, but we get there in about 20 minutes. Now we are at Register Cliff. They call it Register Cliff because this is where travelers on the Oregon Trail would carve their names and carved who they loved, sometimes the year, and they'd carve it into this rock. Now, today, can you do that? No, it's illegal. You can 
actually get in a lot of trouble for that. So we're not going to do that. However, you can see that a lot of names have been carved in recent years. A lot of that history has been lost. However, if you look closely enough, you can still see some original names that were carved by the original pioneers on the Oregon Trail. Register Cliff rises about 100 feet above the North Platte River. No one knows the first person to carve their names to, quote, register their journey west here, but in the 1840s and 1850s, thousands, if not tens of thousands of immigrants carved their family names on this chalky limestone rock. Register Cliff is near what is today Guernsey, Wyoming. If you want to check out the Oregon Trail, but only have time to visit one place, I strongly recommend Guernsey. There are so many Oregon Trail sites either in Guernsey or nearby. Most famously, the Guernsey Ruts, which we head to next after climbing a really steep mountain. Oh yeah, the landscape has dramatically changed here in Guernsey. So we've got some more names here carved, and these are actually legit from the 1840s or 1850s, pretty cool. But yeah, I'm standing in the Guernsey ruts, which are the most famous ruts along the Oregon Trail. And you might be thinking like, Mr. B, why are these so deep? <laughs> this is, well, wagons had to cross here since it was so difficult to get through this area. At some spots, the track is worn down as deep as six feet, making these the most dramatic ruts along the entire length of the Oregon slash California Trail. Years and years of thousands of wagons going over the exact same route made it so that this basically is an unintentional monument. Believe it or not, this used to be up to here. Up to up, up to here, yeah. Just think about all the thousands upon thousands of wagons that made their way through here. And by the way, this is on a really big hill. That's why I'm sweaty and out of breath. My youngest daughter has a bit of a spill here, unfortunately. Not only does she scratch up her knee, but she severely damages her phone. It's the first trail casualty. Next, we stop by the third grave on our journey, the grave of Lucindy Rollins. Lucindy started her journey in Dayton, Ohio, and died at this spot in June 1849. Someone vandalized her original headstone and supposedly threw it into the nearby river. Years later, a journalist found it, and that's how we know about her. But we don't know much. We know she was 24, but we don't know what she died of. One in 10 immigrants died while traveling on the Oregon Trail. I think we'll be fine though, hopefully. We next head off the trail to Wheatland to once again charge the car, approaching the dramatic Laramie Range. We've made it to our first supercharger for the day. Maybe the only one actually. It's been a pretty good route today. Plus we charged overnight last night. Anyway, you can see behind me kind of. Laramie Peak, which was the first major mountain that travelers on the Oregon Trail saw when traveling west. It was usually pretty breathtaking when they first saw it. Even from this spot here, the supercharger, we're still about 30 miles away from it. Yeah, ever since Fort Laramie, we've been climbing into the mountains. We finally made it to the mountains. For travelers on the Oregon Trail, that meant much more difficult terrain to traverse. For us in an EV, I'm not too worried about it. One thing about this location is it's kind of isolated. There's only one place to eat. We were gonna eat lunch here, but our choices are A and W, and that's it. So I guess we ha we'll have to enjoy some A and W for lunch. After leaving Wheatland, we realize by the time we reach our next destination, the National Historic Trail Center in Casper, Wyoming, the museum will be closed. I email them to let them know that we won't be there until tomorrow morning. We find a hotel in the lovely city of Casper to settle down for the night. We are running behind and we're gonna run behind even more today because of the charging situation. I'm letting the girls uh, sleep in and I am headed early 
to the National Historic Trails Interpretive Center here in Casper, Wyoming. There, I get to interview Kathleen Hansen of the aforementioned National Historic Trail Center. What really helps people connect to the trail isn't just information, it's actually learning the stories of the people, it's being hands-on, being very interactive, and so that's what our center here does. So it actually gives you really good information, um, but not in a super boring way. Go to our Oregon Trail Gallery. We have an actual wagon you can sit in, and it rocks back and forth as you cross over the Platte River. Uh, listen, no matter what happens, just sit still. Yeah, we never really spend a lot of time thinking about what actually happened and what it was actually like for those pioneers that went west. So it fascinates us to think about, did people really go 2,000 miles in a covered wagon? How did they even do that? What was that like? We're having such a hard time driving in a Tesla. Do you know the average distance that each traveler went on an average day? It depended on the landscape they were in. On a good day, yeah. they could get up to 20 miles. Um, okay. Usually you're going probably closer to like 12. Okay. Um, maybe. Even not just the South Pass, but all around Wyoming, like there's mountains, but mm -hmm. like there's lots of space around them. Mm -hmm. Like there's lots of openings. You get to Casper and it is very mountainous around the city. And so they did have to avoid those by actually leaving the river, travel overland without any super reliable water source. There were a couple springs they could hit along the way, mm -hmm. but nothing as good as a river. But back then it could have taken them two days to get to the Sweetwater River. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. That's the stretch we're going on next between we're basically the North Platte and mm -hmm. the Sweetwater. We do have some county roads that follow um, the actual trail. Mm -hmm. So you'll probably be on those then in your little Tesla. Once again, I pretty much have the museum to myself and it's a Saturday. The Interpretive Center has separate sections dedicated to the Oregon, California, and Mormon trails, as well as the Pony Express, but I obviously spend most of my time in the Oregon Trail section. It's a fun place that has a lot of interactive stuff for kids, even though I unfortunately didn't bring my own kids. And the view from the center is amazing too. We were supposed to uh, make it to Idaho today and we are not going to. I've been bummed out about it because uh, we haven't been able to visit as many places unfortunately. So anyway I'm charging again right now and the girls are still sleeping or swimming. I don't know what they're doing but after I do this and get some snacks I'll head back to the hotel and pick them up. All right I loaded up at the local general goods store. Where are we going first today? So let's just first put the supercharger in that's in Rollins. If we went straight there, we'd be at 50%. So we, um, but we're stopping by places. That's where travelers crossed over the um, North Platte River. And stop, and then we're gonna go to, after that, we're gonna go to Willow Springs. We'll be on some dirt roads today, but, oh gosh, it's not even showing up on the, Okay, we'll just we'll sk skip over that one for now. We also want to do it now because we'll not have internet access. Well, we do know we want to go to Independence Rock, so that's that's the other location. So I'll put that on there. Okay, we figured it out. Those extra spots that don't show up on um, <laughs> they don't show up on any kind of internet map, but at the museum, um, Kathleen gave me this map and highlighted where I can find that stuff. It goes along here. It's a dirt road. We'll have to go very slow on it. We head southwest on a beautiful and surprisingly much cooler day. Then it's time to cross another river. We've made it to Bessemer Bend, where the North Platte River bends. For immigrants, the North Platte River was often 300 yards wide and definitely not easy to cross, especially before 1847 when ferries finally were able to help you. And once they forded it, they wouldn't see the North Platte River ever again. They said goodbye to this river. Yeah, I said they forded it, but they often probably did not unless they raised their wagon boxes by putting blocks on the axles. They probably usually tried to float across 
it. And the next stretch would be a pretty dry and desolate stretch, and that's what we're taking next. We're actually going to be driving some dirt roads that overlap the Oregon Trail, and it will be in the middle of nowhere. We will have no cell service, and our battery will slowly be dying. It shall be an interesting day. Yep, we are pretty freaking nervous as we are taking the Tesla on the most isolated stretch of the journey yet. For the next 50 miles, we will be on crappy dirt roads that more or less follow the Oregon slash California Trail exactly. We only pass by one other human being during the entire stretch, a kind rancher who seems confused about why we are out here. We do see lots of cows, including many cows that are like, what are you doing here? And refuse to move out of the way. Okay, Stop just one of them's gotta go, and then the rest of them will follow. Stop it. Immigrants in this area constantly worried about dehydration as there wasn't much water around now that they had left the North Platte. There wouldn't be another reliable freshwater source until they got to the Sweetwater River, which was about 50 miles southwest. If they did encounter water, often it was too poisonous to drink. A dude named J. Goldsboro Bruff wrote of this area in 1849, quote, The water here, strong alkali, was the color of coffee and piled around were hundreds of dead animals, chiefly oxen. After passing through the immigrant gap, we see another natural landmark. Okay, behind me is another landmark along the Oregon Trail called the Avenue of Rocks because they look like an avenue of rocks. And we are on the literal Oregon Trail, but that also means we are Pretty far from civilization at this point. Zero bars on the cell phone, but that's okay. It's all part of the experience, honey. This is quite an arid area. We are in a wasteland, but fortunately we stocked up with water before we left Casper. Before 1850, there are tales of an oasis that sprung up in the desert called Willow Spring, located about halfway between the North Platte River and Sweetwater River, where the water was delicious and the willows offered shade from the heat. Now we're at Willow Spring. This place may look unremarkable right now. It just features a dead cottonwood tree surrounded by cow poop everywhere. But back in the day, this was a happening spot. In the 1840s, it was the first major source of fresh water travelers encountered after leaving the North Platte River, and it was, a, it was an oasis. It became a favorite camping place, and even as late as 1847 was still a lush spot. That year, a Mormon pioneer named Heber Kimball wrote in his diary, quote, this spring is perfectly clear, cold as ice water, and of a very good taste. There is a willow grove extending for some distance above and below it, which would answer well enough for camping purposes. The grass is good and plentiful, and it is one of the loveliest camping spots we have seen on the road. Between 1848 and 1849, thousands of immigrants had ruined the spot. Even as early as July 5th, 1849, another immigrant named Edward Jackson wrote of the spot, quote, so many camping here makes it a waste. No no grass and the willows cut down, broken wagons and trash of all kinds together with 30 dead cattle makes it a loathsome place. We hurried away and pressed on to the Sweetwater. By the 1850s, the place was a wasteland. It went from this oasis to pretty much desolate like the surrounding area. Trying to get through on the Oregon Trail. Could you please get out of the way? We have to get through here. Okay. Anyway, so we're gonna try to get these cows out of the way. I well, we gotta drive through. Ha, ha, ha. 
I'm going five <laughs> miles an hour because it's like. <laughs> oh, I can go up to 10 now. Go to the right. Go to the right. Trust me. Okay. We're so close yet so far away. Okay, it's gotten a little better. We're still only going five miles an hour. Oh, man. <laughs> no, go to the right a little bit more. <laughs> we are now on Prospect Hill, which was another landmark that was well documented by travelers on the Oregon Trail. Behind me, if you look closely enough, you can see Independence Rock, which we will be headed to next. We are still far from civilization, but this uh, vantage point was pretty amazing, like 360 views. But I think the main thing that the pioneers were worried about is behind me because they realized well, we can't really go around mountains too much longer. Sooner or later, we're going to have to go through them. But, but just maybe there will be a pass through those mountains. Eh? It was another popular camping spot that many immigrants wrote about. William Clayton was the leader of the first group of Mormons to get here on June 20th, 1847. He wrote, quote, The view from this hill is one of romantic beauty which cannot easily be surpassed, and as President Young remarked, would be a splendid place for a summer mansion to keep tavern. Well, no one ever built that mansion. Today, there is no human in sight at the spot. You're more likely to encounter antelope than humans. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's just think about this. Go that way. That way. No, not this way. No, you said this way originally, and I think you were right, actually. Okay, you're just gonna have to go fast. <laughs> just go. Just go. Okay. Whoa. We made it. <laughs> we made it. The next stop in the computer game is the famous Independence Rock. And it kind of does look like that, yeah. We made it to Independence Rock before July 4th. Actually, no, we're here in August, but it doesn't matter. We're not using a wagon to take the Oregon Trail. Anyway, it's called Independence Rock, not because it's independent from all the other rocks around or anything like that, but because the goal traveling west on the Oregon Trail was to get to this rock by Independence Day or July 4th. If you got to this rock after Independence Day, you might be too late. In other words, you might be getting up into the mountains when it's getting cold in the fall and into the winter, and that may prevent you from getting to Oregon or California. A lot of people did get here by the 4th of July. In fact, so many people climbed up this rock that there even was this lady, this random lady, who sold pies to people at the top of the rock. Just imagine, like, getting to this point along the Oregon Trail, going to the top of that rock, and just randomly coming across a lady selling pies and what a great way to celebrate the fourth. Independence Rock is one of the most written about landmarks along the trail. It's about 1,900 feet long and 850 feet wide. On July 26, 1849, Jay Goldsboro Bruff wrote of it, quote, at a distance looks like a huge whale. It is being painted and marked every way all over with names, dates, initials, so that it was with difficulty I could find a place to inscribe it. Thousands camped here, and yep, thousands also carved their names and messages into it, turning it basically into a bulletin board for Oregon Trail travelers. Okay, we're gonna climb the rock. See if we can see some names engraved up there. 
When I get to the top, it's very windy, but I find some of those cool carvings. It's not the easiest thing to climb for most folks, but if you can make it, the views from the top are awesome. There's also a trail that goes around the entire base of it, but watch out for rattlesnakes down there. We pass by Devil's Gate next, and we had planned on going to Split Rock and Three Crossings, but realized, holy crap, we'd better charge the car again. So once again, we are off the trail as we head south to Rollins. By the time we leave Rollins, it's too late to visit the South Pass, and we'd have to really backtrack anyway, so we decide to catch it tomorrow and instead head to Rock Springs, Wyoming to spend the night since Rock Springs also has a supercharger. At this point, we are a full day behind schedule. I was supposed to interview Becky Smith and Jeff Johnson at the National Oregon slash California Trail Center in Montpelier, Idaho yesterday and try to reschedule the interview with them today. But as it turns out, the center is closed on Sundays and Becky emails back ominously. Sounds like a typical trail journey. Sorry for missing you. Maybe we'll meet again sometime. Here's hoping the trail is kinder to you. Not only that, we have to backtrack because we just gotta visit this spot, one of the most important markers along the trail. Oh, and it's the halfway point. Uh, yeah, that's right. We are just now halfway done. Now we're at the South Pass, which was a big gap in the Rocky Mountains that made it much easier to get through the massive mountain range. To the north, mountains. To the south, mountains. But in between the South Pass, which was nice and smooth. So many immigrants came through here as a much easier way through the mountains. The South Pass is about 20 miles wide and arguably the most important landform along the immigrant trail because it literally opened the West to settlement by providing an easy way for wagons to travel over the Continental Divide. It's also the next stop in the computer game, by the way. Nope, doesn't look like that. And it's here in the game where the trail divides and you either head down for the Green River Crossing or go to Fort Bridger. Well, we're gonna do both actually. First, we head to another spot, the Donner Party Camped At. Another common stopping point on the Oregon Trail was crossing the Big Sandy River, which is uh, not so big anymore. Then we do get to the Green River. It doesn't really look green. Travelers on the Oregon Trail had a ferry across. We were fortunate we didn't have to ferry. We just drove over it on a bridge. And then another welcome site for travelers on the Oregon Trail was Fort Bridger, which is located in modern day southwestern Wyoming. We are here to stock up on supplies and take a rest. We got our supplies actually at a convenience store. But travelers would arrive here often desperately in need of new supplies. So mountain man Jim Bridger established Fort Bridger in 1842. And it indeed became a really important resupply point for wagon trains. Trains. Later, it'd be an important military post during the Utah War. It closed down in 1890, but today is remarkably preserved. The Fort Bridger State Historic Site features 27 historic structures and four historic replica structures. Here's what it looks like in the computer game.
Next up, we head off the trail yet again to charge and eat. And then we enter Utah, and then we're back into Wyoming to hop back on the trail, soon crossing into the great state of Idaho and the beautiful Bear River Valley. This big hill behind me is called Big Hill. Actually, that behind me is the real big hill. It was a big obstacle when going down into the Bear River Valley here in eastern Idaho. Yeah, Big Hill is a mountain, and it was likely the steepest and longest descent along the entire Oregon Trail. Many wagons needed to be tied to ropes, which were tied to trees, so that they wouldn't go out of control down the mountain. We brought the necessities on the Oregon Trail, Slinky. My daughter stuck that on the wagon, yeah. <laughs> Soon we are in Montpelier, Idaho, and the National Oregon slash California Trail Center. But remember, it's closed, and Becky and Jeff aren't there for me to interview them, so onward we go. Next up is another famous spot along the trail, and the next featured in the computer game. and one where Tom Scott also recently visited. What's crazy is that Tom Scott released a video about this place on his channel just a few days before we arrive. Well, now we're in Soda Springs. They'd come here and they'd marvel at the carbonated water that just came from the ground naturally. The immigrants loved Soda Springs, and it certainly was one of the natural wonders along all of the Overland Trails. Immigrants used the hot water to wash clothes clothes, and even drank the natural soda water. We didn't try any, but apparently many drank it straight from the ground, and Tom did in Hooper Springs Park. On July 24th, 1838, Sarah White Smith wrote of it, quote, We find it excellent for baking bread. No preparation of water is necessary. Take it from the fountain, and the bread is as light as any prepared with yeast. After Soda Springs became a town, and the locals built a residence, Reservoir, they inadvertently destroyed many of the local hot springs. And of course, if there's hot springs, there's also often geysers. And in 1937, the leaders of Soda Springs accidentally created a new one. Soda Spring Geyser is the world's largest human created geyser. It is now controlled by a timer and it erupts once every hour on the hour and that's controlled by humans. Oh, and it's also the only captive geyser in the world. The girls seem to dig it. Next, we head to another hot springs hot spot. Okay, we made it to Lava Hot Springs, which is today a booming tourist town. Lots of people on rafts just uh, chilling in the hot tubs that are natural. But that's exactly what travelers on the Oregon Trail did when they came through here. It was a, a place where they could stop and relax in the natural hot springs. They'd bathe, they would wash their clothes. Lava Hot Springs was another Another popular stop for immigrants, and I would dare say a tourist spot even back in the 1840s. And it's notable also because it had long been considered a neutral spot for all Native American tribes. A place for everyone to put aside their differences and relax. And now it's getting late, so we decide to stay the night in Pocatello, Idaho. The whole area is incredibly scenic. Today we will be in the Tesla more than any previous day because our goal is to get all the way across Idaho into Oregon. It will be intense and we are all already really, really tired after seven days of doing this, so. We will see if we survive. The next landmark in the computer game is Fort Hall. In real life, there were actually multiple places in the area called, quote, Fort Hall, which leads to much confusion today. So this is the Fort Hall replica. We're not able to go inside because we have to hit the trail here soon, but 
just a little bit about this place. They built this, I believe, in the 1960s uh, because the original Fort Hall, which is north of here, is no more. Fort Hall was a very important stopping point for travelers on the Oregon Trail slash California Trail, which I'm not going to be saying that anymore after this because shortly after Fort Hall, the California Trail broke away from the Oregon Trail. The California Trail heading for California and the Oregon Trail headed toward Japan. And so, no, Oregon, sorry, scratch that, Oregon. Old Fort Hall, which today is northwest of Pocatello, started out as a fur trading post in 1834, and Hudson's Bay Company eventually ended up buying it. After the United States took control of the area in 1846, also, Fort Hall was the first time the Oregon Trail met up with the magnificent Snake River, which we will be seeing next. All right, we are about done charging here in Pocatello. Hello, Idaho. We're going to swing by Walmart to get a few supplies before we head back on the trail. In particular, I got to get another SD card because I've taken so much footage on this trip. Anyway, most of today we will be on Interstate 86, but we will be getting off the interstate a couple times to see some Oregon Trail sites up close. The goal is to get to Baker City, Oregon by the end of the day, so we'll see if we make it. After we charge the car and get breakfast, we are back on the interstate and the drive gets much more boring. But we soon do get a tubular view of the legendary Snake River. Native Americans have lived along the Snake River for at least 11,000 years, and after the California Trail broke away from it, the Oregon Trail followed the river for hundreds of miles. There were few opportunities to safely cross it. In the computer game, that's the next landmark, by the way, but we're not ready to cross the Snake River yet. Behind me is what is known as Massacre Rocks. It got that name from being a notorious location. This is a place where Chief Pocatel Hello's band of Shoshone commonly attacked travelers headed west on the Oregon Trail. In 1862, they actually murdered a group of travelers here, and so this became a scary place afterward. This is also an area where the mosquitoes are particularly bad, especially as you get closer to the Snake River, and the nights are very cold. Even in the summer, it gets pretty cold at night here, but during the day, very, very hot. So not ideal camping situations here, but at least least they had fresh drinking water nearby. We next find another isolated park to check out some ruts. We are at the Milner Historic Recreational Area and we're the... What? Recreation! We... We are at the Milner Historic Recreation Area. We're the only ones out here on this Monday morning and all around us are trail ruts. You just kinda, you gotta know where to look for them. This was a very hopping camping spot as well, not too far from the Snake River, which you can see behind me. Although the bugs were so bad, I don't see how they dealt with it. We get eaten up. But again, the actual trail goes through here, so that's pretty cool. Then it's already time to charge and get lunch. We are live here in Twin Falls, Idaho, at the coolest Tesla supercharger we've been to yet. You've got the visitor center here, you've got basically a mall back here, tons of restaurants, but most importantly, this canyon basically is just picturesque. It's a very cool spot, so if you're ever near Twin Falls, it's a great place to charge your, your car. We are quickly running out of time and decide to push forward to one of the most important and challenging river crossings on the entire Oregon Trail. Tens of thousands of immigrants chose this spot to cross. If they didn't cross here, they'd have hundreds of miles ahead along the dry, rocky south bank of the river until they got to Fort Boise. It's about 103 degrees out here but we are at Three Island Crossing, which is a popular point where travelers on the Oregon Trail forded the Snake River, but often if they try to ford it, they wouldn't make it. There were many casualties for folks trying to cross at Three Island.
It wasn't until 1869 when Gus Glenn finally built a ferry nearby to help people cross it. Today, this area is in Three Island Crossing State Park, and there's another cool museum we check out. Yet again, we are the only ones there. Next, we finally return to civilization. We are in Boise charging. This is the first supercharger where all of them were taken except for one. Also, I just realized that Boise is the first big city we've encountered since we began in Kansas City, which is kind of crazy. After eating and charging, we head to yet another Hudson's Bay Company Fort. All right, we are now at Old Fort Boise, or at least a replica of it, as you can read behind me, probably. Old Fort Boise was only around for a few years as another important stopping point to restock up on supplies and rest. A trader named John Reed created the original fort way back in 1813, near where the Boise River meets the Snake River. But Native Americans killed him and most of his party. In 1819, another trader named Donald McKenzie built a new fort at the same spot, but again was chased out by Native Americans. In 1834, Thomas McKay of Hudson's Bay Company yet again built a new fort at the same spot, but it seemed that Fort Boise was cursed. After a devastating flood and an Indian raid, the fort shut down in 1854. But yeah, at least it made the computer game. We leave as the sun starts to go down, cross over into Oregon, and drive through some more breathtaking scenery to finally find a hotel right next to a supercharger in Baker City. We made it. There's only one day left on the journey. Similar to Guernsey, Wyoming, Baker City, Oregon is another Oregon Trail hotspot with the National Historic Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, as well as lots of nearby trail sites. Our hotel was even Oregon Trail themed. Some of the most well-preserved ruts we have seen yet are near Baker City, near what's known as Flagstaff Hill. It was another tough area for immigrants to travel through, though. I'm standing actually on the trail right now. Uh, let's come on, let's walk. We're walking the Oregon Trail right now. Holy. So this is all left behind from all those wagons. Soon we arrive at a spot many immigrants wrote about where they saw a big tree sitting all by itself on the floor of the Baker Valley, believed to be some kind of pine tree. Travelers called it the Lone Tree of the Oregon Trail. Unfortunately, someone chopped it down in 1843. Next, we approach and enter the epic Blue Mountains, which certainly look blue, especially compared to the landscape we were just in. The Blue Mountains are the next landmark in the computer game and always the area where members of my party seemed to die, by the way. But we don't die, so it's all good. After we got through the Blue Mountains, the view was even more spectacular. In the computer game, your choice from here is to either go to Fort Walla Walla or the Dalles. We go for the Dalles. But first, it's the Tomusklik Cultural Institute, a museum and research center located on the Umatilla Indian Reservation near Pendleton, Oregon. Often we only get the American perspective when we learn about the Oregon Trail, but we're here to get the Native American perspective. In particular, the perspective from the Umatilla, Cayuse, and Walla Walla tribes. Again, we were pretty much the only ones there, but I highly recommend this place. Even though Americans often celebrate the Oregon Trail today, often Native Americans view the trail as just another way Europeans and Americans encroached on their sacred lands and way of life. And then another 45 minute charging stop. I'm bored, man, because I'm in bored, man. 
Oregon. But just a brief stop because we really didn't have to. We could have made it all the way to the Dalles, but it would have been like 11%. So just to play it safe and stop to go to the bathroom. The girls are playing on the playground, which it's a nice little spot despite the pollution behind me. There was a trail tragedy. Mrs. Beat was closing the back door and she didn't know I was back there and it popped me on the head. Hey, it beats cholera, so we're okay. We should be reaching the end of the trail tonight, unless the car dies, but lots of charging stations in Oregon, so I just don't see that happening. Soon we are upon the grandest of all rivers on this journey, and the one that tells us that our trip is almost over. We are at Biggs Junction, which is the first place where many travelers on the Oregon Trail saw the Columbia River, which is behind me. This is the river the Lewis and Clark expedition found most challenging, but also gave them hope that they would soon reach the Pacific Ocean. Today, the Columbia River forms most of the border between Oregon and Washington State before emptying into the Pacific Ocean. It's massive, having the greatest flow of any river on the continent entering the Pacific. And unlike the Snake River, much of the Columbia flows goes through a dramatic gorge. Next up, a place on the trail where immigrants had to make a difficult choice. Okay, we're in the Dalles, Oregon, and we just ate lunch at a bar and grill here behind me. However, the supercharger station is about a mile away. So what I did is I dropped off the girls and I told Mrs. Beat what I wanted. Then I went to the supercharger, got it started. It said 45 minutes. Then I walked all the way back to the restaurant and now I'm walking back to get the car. Should be completely charged by the time I get there. It started to rain. <laughs> I couldn't find the umbrella. This has been quite the adventure today. The Dalles actually marked the end of the Overland Oregon Trail. From here, travelers had to hop on the Columbia River, build a raft, hop on a boat somehow with all your belongings, and sail down the Columbia to the Willamette Valley. Now, there was a another way that we're actually going to take, and that is the Barlow Road, a trail that went around Mount Hood, and we will be taking that route ourselves for the rest of our journey. And yep, that's also the choice you have in the computer game. We pay the toll. Well, today it's free. Keep in mind that the Barlow Road didn't open until 1846, and so before then, it wasn't an option. Just 80 more miles. As we leave, it's an incredibly beautiful drive in a lush, heavily forested area, much different than the landscape we've seen for the vast majority of this trip. I mean, for crying out loud. At one point on the stretch, I see Mount Hood in front of me and Mount Adams literally in my rear view mirror. The road gets quite windy before we come upon our last gravesite. Okay, we are just at the base of Mount Hood, far from civilization. Sometime in the 1840s, a woman died here. We don't know how she died, but we do know she was headed to the Willamette Valley and just a few miles away from the Willamette Valley. So it's extra tragic. It wasn't until 1924 that engineers building the Mount Hood Scenic Byway, tracing the old Barlow Road route, came across an old wagon tongue and casket that, as it turns out, was the remains of this unidentified pioneer woman who made it so close to the Willamette Valley. And there's another account of a husband losing his wife that was connected to this body, and that's all the information we have. Today, this woman is simply known as the Pioneer Woman, and you can visit this area as you're traveling past the Oregon Trail. I'm getting eaten up by mosquitoes. 
Next, we begin our descent and drive down Laurel Hill, which was the last major obstacle on the Oregon Trail. Similar to Big Hill back in Idaho, immigrants needed their wagons tied to ropes, tied to trees, to slowly make their way down the steep, rocky banks of the mountain. Some immigrants tied giant logs to the back of their wagons to slow their descent, but often, accidents would occur here. We drive down just fine, and soon we're in a beautiful valley and our final landmark. We are at Philip Foster Farm on the last leg of the Barlow Road on the home stretch. We are so close to the end of the Oregon Trail and so many travelers on it stopped here and they slept well knowing that their journey was almost over. They loaded up on supplies and enjoyed the hospitality of Philip Foster who purchased this acreage in 1847. Originally from Maine, Philip Foster and his family arrived in Oregon country not via the Oregon Trail, but via ship going all the way south of South America, up and around. They got here in 1843 and were among the earliest Americans to settle in the area. Around the time they arrived, the local government said all white male citizens got 320 acres of free land. And, oh, and their wives also could get 320 acres of free land. A pretty good deal that the Fosters definitely took advantage of. Now remember, this was before Oregon was officially part of the United States. After the United States did take over the area, Congress passed a law called the Donation Land Claim Act that legitimized all those 640 acre claims and said that married couples who arrived in Oregon after 1850 could get half that amount of free land. It was the most generous federal land act in American history. Anyway, the Fosters 640 acres became one of the final stopping points for travelers on the Oregon Trail. Foster set up a general store, cabins for rent, orchards, gardens, and pastures set up for livestock passing through. It was a swell setup. And then we are almost there, finally. We will be there in 22 minutes and have a battery of 54%. Okay. 15 more miles. Let's go. I can't believe we're almost done. We are really close. One mile away, holy mackerel. Two minutes, you know, on the Oregon Trail in the 1840s, 1850s, they, they didn't have GPS, they wouldn't know. They'd be getting close and they'd be like, uh, I think we're close, I think, yeah. yeah maybe or just around that bend. Yeah, no, or okay, maybe around this bend. But we know exactly precisely when we're going to get to the end of this trail because we've made it to Oregon City according to GPS. Stoplights on the Oregon Trail. It's been such a long journey. We are... Yeah, hey, did you be quiet? I'm trying to... Okay. Yeah, I know. It's been such a long journey. It's, it's been eight days. We've been driving for eight days. We didn't go all interstate. We, we tried to stay true to the actual Oregon Trail as best as we could, but we made it in this vehicle without running out of now battery. Now turn left. The end. The Oregon Trail. <laughs> Wait a second. Now you have arrived at your destination. Woo! Woohoo! We made it to paradise. We even had folks to greet us when we arrived. Katrina, who you met before, and Briggs from the channel The World According to Briggs, who also lives in the Willamette Valley. 
It's a long trail. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, it was definitely stressful. It was definitely a challenge, especially in Nebraska and Wyoming yeah. charging. Like in particular, the part that stands out the most is I really wanted to get the South Pass. Yes. Because like, you know, it's an important yeah. landmark. But there's uh, nothing around there. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so we drove, we're like, okay, well, we got to charge. Okay, let's go down to Rollins. Uh -huh. So we went all the way down to Rollins, uh -huh. which is off the trail. <laughs> and then like, well, if we go back up, we'll still be screwed. Wait, and so you we lose your charge going back to the trail. <laughs> right. So we went over to Rock Springs. Okay. We charged again. That's where we spent the night. And then I was like, okay, we still got to get South Pass. By that point, we had a really backtrack. Oh. So it, it ended up adding like two hours to the, tra yeah. the trip. <laughs> you did not go on dirt roads much at all. We right? did not drive on the dirt roads as much. We, we went on some dirt get roads. Lost. Well, it, it, we did in uh, Kansas. Okay. Um, so not too far from where we lived. But then in Wyoming, that's where we ran into some cows on the road. Some cows, yeah. Multiple times. <laughs> the Tesla was driving over poop regularly. <laughs> if you ever do this, don't just rely on Google Maps because a lot no. of times stuff won't yes. be on there. Yeah. It's always awkward with this thing. Awkward is my middle name, though. I was getting taller, and my doctor was worried about my height, so <laughs> asked me to slow it down. Hey, I finally got to meet you, so that's cool. But here we are in Oregon, <laughs> of all places. You're from Kansas, and you come all the way out here for a vacation? Yeah, heck yeah. You're not a good decision maker right there. <laughs> the journey here was just very desolate and dry and kind of depressing places on the way. Oh, yeah. So when they do get here, I the can feel it. I can water relate. everywhere and yes. the greenery and things like that. Yeah. And back in the day, there's so many animals and everything they could eat here. This was a great place to live. I still think it is to this day. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the top four states to live in in the United States. Yeah. Just outside of Portland. <gasps> It's really hard to find a bad place to live in Oregon if you're coming from someplace like California or New York or let's say Miami. Just do yeah, your research. I mean, desirable places are expensive. Let's yes. Let's face it. Yeah. They don't give free land away here anymore, unfortunately, like they did in the 1850s. So. Yeah, but back then I think you had to have a requirement of at least one family member dying of dysentery. So that was that. <laughs> that, was, that was it. Did, did anyone die of dysentery? Have a plot of land. I have another... Mr. Beat Rock that I'm going to place here at the end of the Oregon Trail. I'm going to stick it in the end of the Oregon Trail historic site sign right here. And so you watching this right now can come get it. If you get it, let us know. Use the hashtag Mr. Beat Rocks. We'd love to see you here and also checking out this wonderful place and you can just keep the rock as a memento. So, and hopefully you take the whole trail. Okay, bye. Well, it's now in the future and we are back home. We, we made it back home and yes, we drove the Tesla back. We put a lot of miles on that thing. In case you're curious, from Independence to Oregon City, it only cost us around $250 in charging fees. $250 traveling a little more than 2,100 miles. If we would have had to buy gas instead, it would have been about twice that amount. Now, if you decide to do this trip yourself, I would recommend not doing it in eight days like we did. <laughs> Spread it out a little bit. Maybe do it in like two weeks at least. Also, one incredible thing we noticed about this trip was the vast emptiness of not only the United States, but of historical places. It's kind of sad how few people visit historical sites. Even at supposedly popular historical spots along the Oregon Trail, we often were the only ones there. Don't get me wrong, I don't like crowds, so I enjoy that. But I also was disappointed about how few tourists I encountered at these historically fascinating spots. This 
This trip certainly felt like an accomplishment. I can't brag about it too much though. Every night we got to rest in very comfortable beds in modern hotels. We didn't have to hunt for our food or fill up our frunk with grains. We ate at nice restaurants where we had access to healthy, fresh food from around the world. Well, I'm not sure how fresh that Subway food was, but you know. And if one of us actually did end up getting dysentery, now we have modern medicine. Every town had a doctor, and most towns had hospitals. Our, quote, wagon had air conditioning. Our wagon was comfortable, and you could stream music and videos in it. Our wagon could go from zero to 60 miles per hour in four seconds. We even had internet access for most of the trip. That said, even with access to all these modern amenities, this trip was stressful. And not only because of range anxiety, just in general, road trips are hard, man. I was cranky for much of it, and yes, we spent a great deal of time fighting during the trip. Upon reflection, I feel sort of guilty for putting my girls through this. Then again, it's a trip we will never forget. And often something is only enjoyable because it's challenging. As Theodore Roosevelt once said, quote, nothing in the world is worth doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. Finally, I hope you consider making the trip yourself, you know? And heck, maybe you can bring the whole family and torture them like I did. What takes us an hour in a car could have taken them a day or two in a wagon. You know, a trip that happened back then in six months from the beginning to the end of the trail, we can now do in like two days. And so it makes us wonder, like, how did they do this? Like, we have a hard time imagining selling our stuff, packing our whole lives into a wagon, and heading into the unknown, and leaving all your friends and family behind. But for them, it was very doable. They were really strong, they were super resilient, and I think sometimes we don't see that in ourselves. We have that capability in us for sure. You are capable of more than you think you are, but we're still people, we're still smart, we're still very ingenious. We can rig up all sorts of things on the roll. Uh, like you guys actually try to do this in your Tesla and finding those charging stations, you're having to make new plans on the fly. Um, these guys did too, problems arose. They had to tackle them, um, same as our family vacations these days. Mrs. Beat and I will be doing a follow-up live stream uh, sometime soon to answer any questions uh, that you may still have about our journey. So look out for that, eh? Also, we are giving away some of these You Have Died of Dysentery shirts. Thank you, Amped Up Learning, for donating those. So we'll give those away during the live stream. Or if you just want to buy one already, I've put a link in the description of this video so you can purchase one. And now it's time for my monthly shout out to all my Patreon supporters who donate to the channel at least 15 bucks or more each month, starting with my biggest donors. Thank you to Adam Lucky, Alicia Solberg, Andrew B, Anthony Beckett, Asif Ismail, Austin Ciros, Bill Dowd, Corey Ryman, Dr. Paul J. Lilly, Empty Machine, Matt Standish, Nick Everett, Pat Iapica, Sean Connett, Specialist Angel Figueroa, Adam Christians, Alex Goral, Andrew Snyder, Blips150, Carmen, Gail Gerard, Grant Hughes, Ian Driscoll, Elon Capone, Jack L, Jacob Birnbaum, Joel Serrano Lozada, Kit Walker, KZ210QB, LT Marshall, Naderade, Samuel Striz, Society's Basement, Steve Bryan, Thomas Oppenheim, Warren Gerog, Waterfort, and Zachary F. Parker. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters and thank you for watching. This is the longest video I ever made.